In the next hour, we want to put a smile on your face, elevate your endorphins, and bring you happiness. Welcome to Say Yes, Be Happy with Natalie Botros. We spend so much of our lives chasing happiness. It might just be where you least expect it to be. Natalie and her guests are going to show you how and where to find it. And now, your host, Natalie Botros. Welcome, everyone. I'm Natalie Botros, your host. Welcome to my show, Say Yes, Be Happy, where each week I interview a different guests from a different field and we find together the happy, the positive, the silver lining. And this week I decided to take the subject of eating healthy and happy. And of course, I know most of you want to lose weight too, but not lose weight with a diet, but smart eating. I know that lately, like not lately, for the last 10 years, 10, 20 years, we get so much information. Some tells us to eat keto. Some tells us to get to be vegan. They tell us protein is good. They tell us protein is bad. Like there's so much information and we're always lost and we don't know what which one to pick. So we try our friends or our neighbors or the celebrity diets and then it ends up like ruining our health because like it's not designed for us. So today I decided to bring you this expert. She's an eating expert and she teaches how to turn food and habit into superpower for health and happiness. She simplifies wellness into doable daily, daily habits that could heal body and mind. She teaches purpose-driven humans how to turn food and habit into superpowers. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, <laughs> but it's true. But everybody <laughs> wants superpowers, so we exactly. can't emphasize that too much. Let's become heroes. <laughs> And she's the founder of the culinarycure.com. She simplifies wellness into doable daily habits that hold the key to enhance wellness and living younger, longer, and better and happier, actually. She's also the author of How Healthy People Eat. I love this title. <laughs> An Eater Guide to Healthy Habits. Please welcome Kristen Caulfield. Hello, Kristen. Hello, Natalie. I am so happy to be here. And I think the timing is really great on this as we're getting into the holiday season. And this can be a really stressful time for people around food and their social life. And, you know, we're coming out after the COVID stuff. So we have more opportunities to be with friends and family. So let's talk about how everybody can turn food into a superpower. Exactly. And then like during COVID, let's be honest, like I think I lost and gained weight two, three times because like we went into cycles, but also everybody waits the new year, the new year to start new resolution, to detox, to feel, why don't we start before? Today, we are. It's like every way is better than tomorrow for me. So let's talk about you first before digging in and with all the questions. How everything started? How did you end up being an eating expert? And what is an eating expert? Oh, uh, thank you for asking. Um, so my background is culinary. I am a trained chef. I had a catering company for years. I am that woman who always used food to show people how much she loved them. So if you had a baby, I was the first person to bring you a meal. You know, um, if you're sick, I'm bringing you chicken soup. So food was always my medium. It's how I showed people I cared for them and loved them. It's how I nourished my family. And, and really, it's food is everything. It's culture, it's community, it's conversation, it's family, it's math, it's science. It's love. <laughs> it's love. It's all of that stuff. So my background's culinary and... When my mom's breast cancer came back, I really turned to food as medicine as a way to help her through that. And unfortunately, I think my story is a little bit of every woman's story. My life was going great until it wasn't. And it wasn't just my mom's cancer. I, I had a really tough decade. Um, my mom's breast cancer came back. My dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We got into some financial challenges. My marriage was in trouble. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. You know, for those of you who are on Facebook, you can see I have a little scar on my neck. And, um, and then my dog died. And that all sort of took place over about 10 years. And my big world became smaller and smaller because it takes all your energy just to get through each day. 
when you're dealing with these kinds of real life struggles. And we all deal with them. But the problem is when we're dealing with them, we feel very isolated and alone. So one day I woke up from a crappy night's sleep. It was like I hadn't slept in about a decade. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like at the end of my rope. I'm like hanging by the end of my rope and there's no more rope. I'm out of rope. And I realize I can't control all of these things, but I can control what is on the end of my fork. And because food has always been my medium, it's how I showed people I love them, it's how I made my living, I turned to food and I didn't put anything into my mouth that wasn't going to serve me. So I started with that one thing and I started using food intentionally. So I had gotten into some bad habits. I was getting up and relying on a couple of cups of coffee to get me going in the morning. And then I might grab a bagel or, you know, a yogurt a little bit later. And of course, this is just jacking my blood sugar, which is triggering my hormones, which is the last thing I need given the stress I'm under. Um, so all of a sudden I'm like, uh-uh, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And I start getting up and I start eating a largely plant-based diet. You know, I start eating, I have water when I wake up in the morning and then I eat some, some fruit. And then a little later, I might have some nuts. And all of a sudden I start to feel better mm -hmm. and I start to look better. And I start to feel like I can deal with everything that's happening in my world. Now I'm still not sleeping you know, because when you're depressed and stressed out, um, you lie awake and your brain is like a filing cabinet and stuff is flying out and you can't get it back in. And so I'm, I'm up at 3, 4 a.m. Might as well go to the gym. So now I'm eating right. I'm going to the gym and everything changes. My body changes. My brain changes through all those feel good endorphins because Exercise helps us be happier. It helps generate those feel-good endorphins. I'm eating food that serves my body. So I'm starting to feel better and happier. And I'm starting to feel stronger. Like I can deal with all of this stuff. And at one point I'm like, hey, I am sure I am not the only woman who finds herself in her 50s and she doesn't recognize her life and there's no playbook for rebooting when the crap hits the fan and what looked like your, your good life, the life you thought you were going to live, evaporates and you find yourself in a life you don't recognize. So I started with food and it led me to the culinary cure, which was my way of creating a place for other women to find the resources they might need to reboot their lives and it led to a T I have a regular TV appearance that I do locally and I wrote a book and it just, it, it changed everything. And it gave me an opportunity to be happy again. And I was unhappy for a long time. Yeah. So let's like, you said a lot of things that I have questions about. So you say <laughs> coffee, you said coffee, you stopped coffee, you felt better coffee. It's a lot of people say that drinking coffee actually can be good for you. Again, it it's like, it's like, I think it's a, it's a personal thing for you. It was not making you feel any better, but for some people it can be good. So how do you know if coffee can be good or bad for you? How do you help your clients with that? And I drink coffee. Uh, you know, if you're watching, you can see I have a coffee maker behind me. Um, I do drink coffee and this is where it gets really complicated for people. Coffee's not bad for you. Coffee's actually a nootropic. It stimulates your brain in a beneficial way. But like everything else out there, coffee's become a highly commercialized product. And you need to know, are your beans grown clean? What's the process that the coffee beans have been through? Are a lot of chemicals being used on your coffee? Are you drinking flavored coffee that might have additives? So you see where I'm going with this. Yeah. So drink coffee, but not like, you know, all those like frappuccinos and like those like sugar adding and do it. That's like the not real even coffee. coffee. I know. That's, <laughs> it's that's a dessert. Actually, that is, 
That is what would have been a milkshake when I was a child. A frappuccino would have been a forbidden sugary treat. So it's important to know that, and tea is good for you, coffee and tea, same thing. With anything you choose in your life that works for you, as far as what you enjoy eating and drinking, think of this. Was it around when your great grandparents were children? Because what's happened is since World War II, we've had this huge industrialization of farming and things have become, um, you know, hugely marketed products. Coffee's one of them, coffee drinks everywhere. When I was a kid, you could get a coffee in the coffee shop for about 60 cents. And now, you know, you go to a coffee shop and you get a, you know, a a latte and it's $6. So there's been a huge profit margin. And this is, this is a problem for consumers and it's with everything. It's with coffee, it's with salt, it's with uh, wine, it's with sugar, it's all of the, it's with grains, all of these high, highly, highly processed and manufactured products have taken things that aren't necessarily bad for us and made them bad for us. So if you're going to drink coffee, which I do, I have a cup every morning. I love it. I have, I know where my beans come from, how they were roasted. I buy from, you know, small batch, uh, a coffee shop that roasts their own beans and they source sustainable coffee. So that's my coffee tip for you. Yeah. And you said that you were like eating mainly plant-based. You don't eat any animal protein. I sure eat animal protein. Uh, okay. I eat animal <laughs> don't protein. Don't scare me because I'm a I, meat lover. <laughs> I eat everything. And, and so this is what the culinary cure is all about. It's about educating people. Diets don't work. There are only like seven things you can't eat, but there's about 7 million you can. So we need to take those seven things that we shouldn't and can't eat out of our diet and focus on all those wonderful things that we can enjoy and eat more plant-based foods in their whole food form. So what are those seven things? (laughs) Well, added sugar. Because sugar, the more we eat sweet, the more we crave sweet. Yeah. So added sugar, natural sugars are fine because they come attached with fiber and phytonutrients and minerals and vitamins. So added sugar, we all have to become label readers, artificial ingredients. If you don't know what it is, why would you eat it? Just because there are chemicals in food does not mean chemicals are food. Yeah. So we got to get the artificial ingredients out of there. Corn is a big no-no unless you're eating, you know, or some kind of organic, you know, ancient grain corn. But corn is one of the most highly produced products, um, plants out there. And the way they grow corn is a problem. Same with soy. So corn and soy should avoid peanuts Peanuts tend to create inflammation. So all the food, all the things we're talking about are things that create a lot of inflammation. Um, Commercially produced eggs. So eggs are really quite good for us, but these eggs that come from chickens that never get outside and are just laying eggs for their whole short, miserable life, we don't need those eggs. So if you want to buy eggs, make sure you get- um, Cage-free, you know? Yeah, there's a humanely raised Exactly. Yeah. Seal that you look for. Um, and what else? Um, I think that's six things. I'm drawing a blank on what the seventh is. But as you can see, that's those are not that's not that hard to get rid of those things. So added sugar, refined grains. Refined uh, grains. Oh, dairy, commercial dairy. dairy. When you what do you mean by commercial dairy? So we can drink cow milk, but it should be from the farm, fresh from the farm. And, and again, and I think this is going to be a theme in our conversation. It's not that these foods are intrinsically bad. It's what's happened to the way these foods and these industries have changed in the past 40, 50 years that's made something that wasn't bad for us into something that is bad for us now. Okay. Yeah. I always say, I say to my clients, like if... 
it, you have to read the labels, the ingredients, but if there are like more than five ingredients in what you buy, you shouldn't buy it or ingredients that you cannot pronounce. <laughs> it's like, they're not food. They're right. you know, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, like those words are like, what is it? If you cannot pronounce <laughs> it, you shouldn't be eating it. And, and also, as you said, like we have to eat happy to be happy. So if you eat a poor chicken's egg who didn't even live like three days, just like hatched an egg and then died, it's not a happy chicken. It, it's the same thing with the animals as well, you know? So I totally understand that. And what about organic food? Are you pro or like you say, you can get non-organic vegetables, but just wash them? Like, what is your point on that? Well, my, I think the thing I would encourage everybody to do as modern day humans, we have started to self-select our nutrients because we have a global economy, we can eat our favorite foods all year round. So what people are doing is they're eating the same food all the time. So we're not getting the big variety of nutrients that we really need. So my best advice is always shop seasonal, shop local, go to your farmer's market, support those small farmers. It is not easy being a farmer. Get to know the farmers, find out if they use a lot of growing chemicals. You will be surprised. It is very expensive to be, become organic, but many of these local farmers are using low intervention farming methods. So you're better off buying local because the food didn't have to travel very far. So it's gonna have more nutrient density to it. And this is a thing people don't realize. When you see those blueberries in January at your farm, at your grocery store, first of all, you don't know how long they've been traveling and blueberries keep for a pretty long time. So if they came from South America, they've, tr they've been transported, they've been stored, you know, so that's affecting the, the, the environmental the fresh, footprint yeah, yeah. and the nutrients over time go down. So we want to eat our food as fresh as possible because that's what we're paying for. Food in its most basic form is calories. Calories in their most basic form are energy. So food is fuel, but the, the quality of that fuel goes down over time. So if you've had an apple in your crisper drawer for two months, it's not going to have the same nutrients of that course. an apple that was just picked will have. Wow. Yeah. I want to continue talking about this. We're about to take our first break. We're talking with Christine Cofield, the eating expert and culinarycure.com. We'll see you just after the break. You're listening to Say Yes, Be Happy. To reach our show today, we invite you to phone in to 1-866-472-5788. That's 1-866-472-5788 or send an email to bvg at the bond-vivantgirl.com. Now back to Say Yes, Be Happy. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Natalie Botros, your host. I'm talking with Christine Cofield about eating right, eating healthy, eating happy. Just before the break, we were talking about the, the seven no-nos, <laughs> seven things that we shouldn't eat. Basically, everything that is not natural, everything that, be, that could be good for you. But now, in nowadays, it's so processed, so fake that you shouldn't eat. During the break, I got a question. Someone says, cheese makes me happy. I, I shouldn't eat it or should I? <laughs> cheese makes me happy too. I love cheese and um, I'm willing to spend a little more to get better cheese. So when we talk about cheese, I'm not talking about the processed cheese that comes in a plastic pre-wrapped container, you know, in the grocery store. I'm talking about real cheese cheese that's made in the traditional ways. I love good cheese. And for people who are sensitive, um, it's important to note that sheep's milk and goat's milk cheeses have a different molecular structure than cow's milk cheeses. So very often people who find themselves um, lactose intolerant can still enjoy sheep and goat's milk cheeses. Okay, yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a good, thing and then also what what's your intake about the the vegan cheese like if i think it's with soy like i don't know how they do it yeah there's some vegan cheeses that um 
there are some really creative people out there making vegan cheeses that taste pretty good. And this is just where somebody's going to have to to try some. You know, you and I talked about the fact that yeah, yeah. in the United States there are there is a woman-owned company, Miko Mikio Coast. Um, she makes butter and cheese and all these vegan things. It's worth trying. These companies have come a long way. And, you know, I'm still going to eat Real the traditional cheese. yeah. cheeses that I love. But I think it's really fun to note that there are some small batch people out there yeah. doing great stuff. I mean, um, I I live most of my life in Switzerland. If I'm going to eat cheese, I'm going to eat cheese. I'm not going to do go and go for it. Are we talking one. raclette? Are we talking exactly. raclette? <laughs> I do raclette parties. I like, I can like eat everything with cheese. You know, I can melt it on the shoe so I will eat it, but a real cheese. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, and I think, I think cheese is tricky for people. You never want to be that girl who's out eating a pizza and you're like, oh, I can't eat cheese. I'm like, bring it on. You know, <laughs> this is why we want to create balance in our life so that we can enjoy all the foods and not not become i mean obviously some people do develop food intolerances but for many of us it's about creating balance and having that balance between you know wellness and lifestyle and understanding how we can use food as a tool to have the body and brain we want to have the health and happiness we want and navigate eating in different social situations. So it's not a crippling anxiety situation where you, you worry about it before, you feel guilty after. Life is about living and we've got to teach people how they can use food to be happy and healthy. Yeah. So you are an eating expert. An eating expert, what is it exactly? It's someone who teaches you how to eat or like, what is it? I deconstruct people's habits around food and I okay. re reconstruct them to serve them better. And what I teach is not a diet. It's a very simple way of looking at food and the world and not eating the things that we know cause inflammation. Or if we do eat them, we eat them occasionally. But when we have these foods, the artificial ingredients, the added sugars, the the commercial gluten, the commercial dairy, um, you know, the soy, the corn, when we have all this stuff coming at us nonstop, it jacks our bodies up. Our body can't process all of the, these foods. It was never designed to ingest them in the quantities we're being exposed to. And that's where this low level IgG inflammation comes from. And that is related to all of the health lifestyle diseases, the obesity, the heart disease, the cancers, the neurological decline. So someone comes to you and then they say, I need to lose weight and feel better and sleep better. So what do you do? You take their, their you ask them to keep a journal. Like what is the process? <laughs> I do, but we never ever go from, everybody I work with is happy at the end, but we never focus on losing weight as being the goal. We focus on being healthy as being the goal. And this diet culture has been so damaging for people because it leads them to make a lot of really bad choices. I have a hard time getting people to embrace healthy fats. And healthy fats are so important for our brain function, for our sex organs, um, for the way our skin looks. So we've got to embrace healthy fats. We've got to embrace healthy fiber. And we've got to embrace a lifestyle that allows us to shop and cook and eat easily and deliciously. And that supports our health. Yeah. So healthy fats, it's what is healthy fats? Tell us for the listeners. <laughs> There's only a couple. So butter from grass-fed cows. Enjoy it. I love butter. Give me a sweet, you know, baked sweet potato. I want a nice big slab of butter on that. Extra virgin olive oil. So good quality olive oil. Coconut oil. Again, good quality coconut oil. Avocado oil. And lard from grass-fed animals. What That's about it. ghee? Ghee is, ghee is butter. 
Yeah, I mean, I clarified butter. So, okay, yeah. so that yeah. one too. Okay. And what is your intake about gluten? Because I know that it became a fashion gluten free. Some people don't even know what is a gluten and they, they just buy gluten free. And I tell them, you know, cigarettes are gluten free. Are you going to like smoke them because <laughs> it's gluten free? It's like really, you know, like what is your take on that? And gluten's a real a real conundrum for people. All humans are gluten intolerant. So we're not really, gluten is a type of plant protein that's largely indigestible by humans. So we all get a little inflammation when we eat gluten. But again, and this is this theme of our conversation, the gluten in our food has changed because the way we produce grains has changed. Exactly. Do you know, do you know that wheat is now harvested two times a year? They've got these genetically modified seeds. They can grow the, the, the wheat twice as fast. They use all kinds of chemicals on the wheat because, you know, it's genetically modified so they can spray, you know, the weeds. And this new wheat is higher in gluten. So not only <laughs> are we getting less fiber in this new, this new type of wheat, we're getting more gluten. So there's just more gluten in our diet. You know, a hundred years ago, people, there might've been a few people that were, you know, struggled with gluten. They wouldn't know what it was. Everybody now is being exposed to gluten in personal care products, in, in food products that normally wouldn't contain gluten. So we're, we're gluten overexposed. So what you asked me was, what is my take on it? I tend to avoid any products that are contain labels that say free, gluten-free, sugar-free, fat-free. If it says free on the label, I don't want it. I would just rather find a product that's naturally doesn't contain the thing that yeah. I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> I, I noticed that, you know, like when it's like low carb or gluten-free, there's a lot of corn. Because like they have to use something to make that that thing look like the same taste. So there is a lot of corn in it. And I'm like, okay, I prefer to eat gluten than corn. <laughs> right. So it, this is why it's so confusing yeah. for consumers to make the right decision. And I'm going to go back to saying, remember, if it wasn't around when your great grandparents were kids, just skip it. Don't eat it. It's as simple as that. Just pivot and find something else. <laughs> yeah. So do you think this is why uh, a lot of people have problems like finding a healthy lifestyle because like there's too much information or there are like other reasons? Uh, the wellness overwhelm is so, so real for people. And, the, and everybody wants to do a great job. I, I mean, who doesn't want to look good and feel great and have boundless energy and sleep well at night? We all do. And, and so we're all trying to decipher what will work. That's part of the reason I created my program. So my program is really a starting point for anyone. It's not a diet. It's a simple, we eliminate things, but we also add water. So I like to say hydration is the low hanging fruit of wellness. And most people address diet without addressing the hydration component. And if we don't get, and almost everybody is not properly hydrated, you can drink a lot of water and still not be intercellular hydrated. So that water is not getting into the cells where your body needs it. So how you do, you, how you drink water that it, it gets into your cells. Like talk to us about your program. It's like, that's <laughs> very, okay. Well, I do have a Facebook group with a, uh, you know, with a free hydration challenge. Um, and, and I find that I use this as a starting point for people because it is overlooked and underutilized in weight management and health management. When we eat a largely plant-based diet, plants come attached with, there's a lot of water in them and they come attached with nutrients. And that's one way of helping us get hydrated. When we eat plants, those nutrients that are in there with the water help the water get into our cells. So we need a couple of things to hydrate better. Most of us are drinking water that's been processed through a municipal processing plant. We don't even think about this. 
And we have water filters on our sinks and, you know, filter bottles. But the water itself has been treated with chemicals to make sure there's no pathogens or dangerous things in the water. As humans, we're actually designed to drink live water, water that contains nutrients and elements that benefit us. So what we can do in this modern day world is we can use our filtered water, but we can add electrolyte drops and we can add, or we can add Himalayan pink sea salt from ancient mines. Those ancient salts that were formed before pollution contain 84 elements, 84 minerals that benefit us and help get that electrolyte blood balance right yeah. so that the hydration goes into our cells. So a formula for hydrating, and this will take two weeks. So if you're listening now and you're like, yes, I'm going to hydrate. Hey, that's free. Anybody can do this. Start each day with eight to 10 ounces of warm or room temperature water. Add the juice of half a lemon or half a lime. Add a pinch of Himalayan pink sea salt that's from ancient mines, not from like, you know, a cheap grocery store because there's a lot of imitation salts out there. Or add a drop of electrolytes, a couple of drops of electrolytes to your water. So eight to 10 ounces of water with the citrus and the salt or the electrolytes. That's how you start your day. Every hour for eight to 10 hours a day, we need to be drinking eight to 10 ounces of water. So eight to 10 ounces an hour for eight to 10 hours a day for two weeks, and then you're properly hydrated. Okay. So drinking just water, bottles of water during the day, it's not going to really help us, especially if we don't eat plant-based where we get like the natural water from fruits or from vegetables. Because we've got to get that balance right between the sodium and the electrolytes so that the water gets into our cells and that our cells can then use it in all of our major organs to function properly. And this is, this is one of those things that people are like, I had no idea I was dehydrated. It never even occurred to me. And a lot of people walk around with their plastic water bottles all day long. You got We got to stop that because we don't need more plastic. Our, one of the reasons we have to buy these ancient sea salts is because all the current sea salt contains microplastics from plastic bottles. So get a water filter for your home, order some electrolyte drops, get yourself some lemons or limes, and, and start hydrating properly. And we don't wanna drink 100 ounces of water at one time, that doesn't help us. We wanna sip it throughout the day. And people think they're gonna to have to go to the bathroom all the time, you won't. You won't, I promise. So all day long, you have to add the lemon and the Himalayan salt or just in the morning? Just in the morning, add the lemon. I, I use the electrolyte drops all day long. Okay. And, and they're like very they're... inexpensive. This, this is not expensive at all. The, the, does it have a flavor or it's like flavorless? It's a little salty. Okay. Yeah. Why I, actually, I actually think the water tastes better um, <laughs> when, when it's in the water. But this is, this is the starting point. This is the foundation on which we can build wellness. So we've got to get everybody properly hydrated because that does a bunch of things. And, and people don't realize this. When we are sleeping, our body is fasting and all of our major organs go through a detox. Our spinal fluid comes up our spine, does a power wash on the brain, takes the metabolic waste. All of that metabolic waste from all of our organs ends up in our lymphatic system. The we lymphatic, have to drain it, yeah. The lymphatic system is between the skin and, and the muscles. And it can't, it's the trash can of the body and it can't move itself. So it requires water and movement to help, help move it out of the body. Okay. We're, gonna, we're about to take our second break. And then when we come back, I want to talk, talk about the movement as well, because I think it's very important in our daily diet. So I see you just after the break.
You are listening to Say Yes, Be Happy. To reach our show today, we invite you to phone in to 1-866-472-5788. That's 1-866-472-5788. Or send an email to bvg at the bond-vivantgirl.com. Now, back to Say Yes, Be Happy. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Natalie Botros, your host. I'm talking with Christine Cofield about eating right. She's an eating expert. She's giving her all her tips. So just before the break, we were talking about the advantages of drinking water, hydrating your body and drinking the, the correct water. Add either some drops of electrolyte or Himalayan salt. And then in the morning, definitely add some lime or lemon in a warm or room temperature water. During the break, someone asked us if the massages are uh, doing massage massages are good for draining the toxin out of our bodies. So absolutely, <laughs> massage is so good for us, and um, it it absolutely helps the lymphatic system drain. There's a lot of wonderful benefits to getting massage, and if you want to be happy, just I think massage should be always on the menu. <laughs> exactly. I agree. So uh, what we were like, we were also talking during the break, eat while you eat, you shouldn't drink. Like what is like, what, what do you advise? Yeah, there are some, before or there are some really, okay. And I know a lot of people are going to want this tip right now that I'm going to give. So because we're coming into the holidays and people are concerned about all the calories that they're going to be coming in contact with, here's one of my tips to help navigate holiday eating and drinking. You do want to be fully hydrated before you ever have a sip of alcohol. So if your goal is 80 to 100 ounces and you know you're going to a party, get on it. Make sure you start early that morning and you're well hydrated before you have your first sip of alcohol. But one of my favorite tips, and I share this all the time with people who want to manage their weight, 30 minutes before meals, put one or two teaspoons of ground raw flax seed into eight to 10 ounces of water and stir it up and drink it down. So ground raw flax seed is going to give you healthy fats. It's got some good omega-3s in it. Lots of good fiber to feed the probiotics, the good bacteria in your gut, and to help you have a better digestive system. And it's going to keep you fuller longer. Plus, you're going to be hydrating with that glass of water. So if you have a couple of teaspoons of ground raw flaxseed, start with one if you're, if you're just starting, and you do this 30 minutes before meals, it actually takes the edge off your appetite a little bit, and you are able to more accurately judge when you're full. And then we talked a little bit, people have some bad habits um, that they've brought to the, the dining table with them, and one is drinking liquids with meals. So people are like, well, I, I thought it was good to drink water with meals. What happens is we are supposed to be chewing our food at least 15 to 20 bites, each mouthful. And what happens is, is we take one, two, three bites, and then we use a glass of water and we wash the food down. And everybody does this. Unless you're sitting there chewing, 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 we are supposed to use our teeth. Our food is supposed to be absolute mush when we swallow it because we get more nutrients out of the food that way. It's easier for us to digest. Our gut doesn't have to create extra acid to break those foods down. So when we add those liquids with meals, people tend to eat too much, they tend to eat too quickly, and they're setting themselves up for potentially having acid reflux. Because yes. now those big pieces of food are down there and your gut's like, oh my gosh, those guys upstairs didn't do their job. Now we got to create acid and break it of down. Of course. And then if we drink water, it kills the acidity. I mean, because like our body naturally uses acids to decompose the food. So it kills it. So suddenly it's like, it's a bad process. But if we go to dinner with friends, we're having wine or like drinks, like we should like not drink during the meal and drink before and after like that doesn't. Well, I think wine is a different category altogether okay. here because we enjoy wine with food. 
but we don't need to be sipping copious amounts of water. We really should be well hydrated. Remember, we wanted to be well hydrated before we got to that dinner, okay. right? Before we're even sitting down, because we don't want to be up all night, you know, going to the bathroom either. So the other tip that I have about eating is um, we are supposed to slow down. So that's where the chewing comes in. And we are supposed to stop eating when we're 80% full. And people are like, how do I know when I'm 80% full? Well, if you slow down and start chewing your food, you will actually know. When we are 80% full, we're actually 100% full, but our body hasn't been able to recognize that yet. It's still trying to figure out what's going on. So we need to slow down, chew our food, not use liquids to wash our food down and stop eating when we're 80% full. And you said you like protein. Mm -hmm. So here's a serving of protein for me. It would be like a circle drawn on my fist and that would be enough protein for me. And what's happened is, is lots of people are eating really big amounts of protein and protein can be hard to digest and protein can also create when we eat too much of it it can create inflammation in our body so we want to eat the right amount of protein i remember that at some point in my life like i couldn't eat like red meat at night because i couldn't i couldn't digest it now i got used to it again but that was just because for a while i was eating like less and less protein and so eating it at night would like make me not sleep well like i wouldn't feel good so no. it's like i think we have to listen our body and then if we buy protein we should again not buy buy happy cows happy meat you know mm -hmm. like organic grass fed like really you have to think that you if you are what you eat you should eat happy foods basically absolutely because if the animals have lived a sad and stressful life all those stress hormones are in the flesh and exactly. then we're eating them. We've got enough stress. Life is stressful enough. We need to do everything we can to make sure we're getting as much pleasure as we can out of the things we do and aligning our consumer dollars with our values. Of course. So uh, another question before we were talking about all these fruits and vegetables, if they should be more organic and or like not traveled like from season, what is your take into frozen food you know like because i know that they're, they're like good ones out there so tell us <laughs> yeah yeah um frozen vegetables can be great and i think the best deal out there is frozen spinach me too uh, <laughs> i love that frozen spinach is great i mean when you look at how many bags of spinach you have to buy to get one little box of frozen yeah. spinach i use frozen spinach all the time um we talked about you know, blueberries, we used an example yeah. of how you'd be better off buying frozen berries that had been flash frozen at the peak of their ripeness. And so preserving the nutrients. Um, same with, with seafood. So much of the seafood we buy in stores has been frozen and thawed. Why not just buy high quality frozen seafood that was flash frozen, you know, when, when the, the seafood was first caught? So yeah. we, we want to get, when we think about food and when we think about eating and we know that food is fuel, we need to really understand that when we buy food, what we're paying for is nutrients. So nutrients translate into dollars, okay? So you, when we buy cheap food that doesn't have a lot of nutrients, that's not a good value. We're better off buying less food, buying higher quality food, and having a plan for all the food we buy. But what people do is they go to the store, they don't have a plan, they shop for food, and they get home and they don't have meals. And so that's what I do. I help people. I meet people at the intersection of lifestyle and wellness. I make healthy eating delicious and easy. And I help it make a lot of sense. Like this is common sense. This is practical wisdom for how we can live better and use food better and still enjoy ourselves. I love to cook. I love to go out to eat. When my family travels, we're drinking coffee, eating croissants in the morning, and we're talking about where we're gonna eat lunch. 
And at lunch, we talk about where we're going to eat dinner because we love to eat. And, and eating is one of life's greatest pleasures. So I like to empower people with knowledge and tools so they can go anywhere and navigate any eating situation. Yeah. Talking about breakfast, lunch, dinner, what's your intake about fasting, intermittent fasting? Um, intermittent fasting can be very good. I use it sometimes. It doesn't work, again, like everybody else. Keto isn't for everybody. Intermittent fasting can be very good. And for your listeners who don't understand what that might look like, there are certainly different ranges for it. So when I decide to intermittent fast, my first meal of the day is at 11 a.m. And the last food that I, and calories I consume are at 7 p.m. So I've, I've got a, a fasting time and then I've got an eating time. So that's what intermittent fasting is. It means we consume all our calories in, in a period of Lots time. Of time yeah. And then we stretch the fast out so that we're forcing our body to burn, you know, stores of fat. It's, it's, it can actually be very beneficial to our brain health. And because food is so easy and cheap, people are eating all the time. So, you know, I like to encourage people to Monday through Friday, have an eating plan, go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time, whatever time you decide to break your fast, because that's what breakfast is, break your fast, yeah. that meal needs to have fiber, fat, and protein, whatever time it is. Ah, okay. So that's a, that's a good tip. So it should have, again, fiber, protein, healthy, healthy fat, and protein. And for women in particular, this will help us balance our blood sugar, which in turn will help balance our hormones. Where if we start breakfast is the sweetest meal of the day. If you have a breakfast of granola and yogurt and a glass of juice, you're going to spike your blood sugar and it's going to create a hormone situation. So what is like, give us an example of breakfast. Yeah. Um, okay. Has anybody heard of, of, of um, a sweet potato toast? No. <laughs> So sweet potato toast, you take a sweet potato, you wash it, and you slice it lengthwise into what looks like, you know, probably a piece of bread, like a thin piece of bread. You rub a little oil on it, and you can pop it in your toaster or oven a couple of times, you know, just to get it cooked. And then you can put avocado on that. I love chia seed pudding. All of these recipes are at theculinarycure.com. Um, and I love to think of breakfast differently than most people think of it. Like I, if there's leftover chicken and salad in there, I might have that for breakfast. We should be eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. We should yeah. be consuming most of our calories in the early part of the day because our body needs them and is going to burn them for fuel. Yeah. And, and then having a good lunch to get us through the afternoon and then just eating a little meal for dinner, but people are eating these huge dinners. Of course, at dinners, yeah. So Kristen, where can we find you? Give us the website, how people can contact you because we're almost about to finish the show and I want everyone to hear about that. <laughs> well, I would love everybody to come and visit me at theculinarycure.com. You can just Google me, Kristen Cofield. Um, and it, my website will pop up. You can also follow me on Instagram where I post healthful tips every single day. I do some funny things in my stories. Um, you can order my book on my website at theculinarycure.com. And you can set up a free five minute call with me, 15 minute call with me. I'm happy to get on a call with anybody and answer any questions. And I am the eating expert. I teach purpose driven humans how to harness the power on the end of their fork to live their healthiest and happiest lives. That's amazing. And also they can download the free gift from healthyhabits.com that I will put under, uh, under the show so they can have the link and then they can just download. Kristen, thank you so much for coming. This was like so many tips, good <laughs> tips. Like I need another hour to get like more tips. I really thank you to come. We, we made it happen. It's been a while that we we're like talking about you coming on the show and thank you listeners. And I see, I 
I meet all of you next Tuesday. And Kristin, again, thank you. And I'm going to say bye for now. What do you have to lose? Say yes. Be happy.